<laughs> yeah, no, I think I don't have MySpace. Um, and I didn't actually, anyways, um, besides the point. So yeah, I, I would like to talk about QFrame um, and uh, Natalie asked about open source projects, so this would be one, but I thought I, I will, I will uh, wait for it until I, I present. Um, yeah, so if you, if you like to, to contribute, if you like the talk and uh, you like the project, then feel free to ping me to do PRs or whatever. Um, I, I'm not the most sophisticated Go programmer. I, as uh, Ole said, I, I'm more from the conservative side of things, from like HPC and uh, data centers in the automotive world. And then I, I moved to be a cloud engineer, whatever. I moved to Berlin and uh, I started in, the cloud, in a startup company in a small one. Uh, because I, I was curious how this startup ecosystem works. And now I work, as I said, for I'm working for uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment. There are a lot of acronyms, but I stick with this one, I think it's easy. And uh, we are the company or the, the division behind PlayStation now, as I, as I said. So a couple of, like last year we started the PlayStation 3 games, so you can play um, PlayStation 3 games without having a PlayStation 3. You can just stream the video and you put the audio in the internet and then you can, um, you can play. And recently we launched uh, our PlayStation 4 offering, so now you can even play PlayStation 4 games on your laptop, on your device, on, your, um, on, on, on a normal client that has only to display the video and has only to send back the control. So it's an, a nice setup, by the way. But that's also not really the, the topic of the talk. Um, I would like to talk about QFrame, and QFrame is an ETL framework, or ETL plus framework, for the containerized world, so I needed a tagline, I, I went with this. Um, and I will just jump in. So the motivation is that I'm using containers now for like four years or three years. So I started with Docker 0 0.7, which was 2013, I think. And um, the motivation was that I worked in HPC, so high performance computing, weather forecast, all this jazz. And I wanted to spin up a data center with this stack on my laptop. And when I started, I, there was no Docker, or at least not on the radar. So I tried to put everything in virtual machines and have every service in virtual machines, but on a laptop, you can imagine that didn't went too far. So I had like five machines and then my, my laptop uh, blew up. So I set it aside a little bit and then I discovered Docker and I started containerizing the services to uh, come up with a holistic data center setup on my laptop. And this is where you also start on uh, how can you monitor the stack, how you can aggregate metrics, how you can aggregate logs, how you can do uh, all this kind of jazz. And um, yeah, from then on, I, I started tinkering around with it, putting everything in a container and trying to uh, apply it to my little world. And I think now I have like 300 or so Docker images on Docker Hub and 300 repositories on, um, on GitHub. So I have a lot of weird stuff there, a lot of uh, stacks I don't even understand, but I put it in a container and then I can run it. Um, like Elasticsearch for, for beginners, I mean, if you don't, uh, you, if you have never used Elasticsearch and you try to install it somewhere, then I mean, you don't understand it. But with Docker, you can easily package something and run it without understanding completely what is going on. And you can download from Docker Hub and you can just run it and it, it works, right? That's the cool part. But as you have a lot of, uh, containers floating around, you need to take care of certain things. And I came up with this nice acronym, Milita, so which is like a German, what is it, a uh, coffee company somehow. And uh, for me, Milita is like metrics, events, logs, inventory, tracing, and analytics or alerting. I'm not sure about the A yet. Maybe I do a double A at the end, but I'm not sure. So it's about having a stack of diverse uh, sorts, and uh, have, but having a one holistic system that takes care of all the um, yeah, logging and metrics and all this jazz to, to make sure that you know what's going on in your cluster. So that's Milita. And as I said, I started, obviously everyone starts with something, so I started with logs. So I l used a lot of the uh, ELK stack back in the days. And then uh, I iterated to metrics, and then I got interested into inventory. So how do you know what's running so that you can have a holistic view on it? And it grew and grew and grew, and now we are at Melita with one A, and maybe next month we are with two A's, and maybe I put another word in it. Okay, so, so far, as said, I used a lot of Logstash, and Logstash, for those who, doesn't, who don't know Logstash, who knows Logstash? I think most of you guys, hopefully, yes, perfect. 
So that's pretty simple in a sense uh, tool. It has inputs, it has filters and outputs. So with inputs you can gather all kinds of, uh, of um, sources. So you can gather syslogs, you can gather just TCP um, or TCP relate messages, you can gather metrics, you can gather uh, CPU metrics or whatever. You can input something and in log stash everything is a JSON file or a JSON blob. So the input will transform it into a JSON blob and then it will go through the, all the other pieces. So filters, there are a couple of, or there are a lot of filters you can use. You can pass log lines, you can uh, derive metrics from log lines, you can do all kinds of stuff. And at the end, when, you, when you're done with uh, massaging your data, you can output it to also a various kinds of uh, outputs. So putting it to Elasticsearch would be the most obvious reason since it's ALK, so Elasticsearch log slash Kibana. But you could also relay it to InfluxDB or to OpenTSDB or put it in a file or whatever. And you can open also use like zero MQ to process it and relay it. <coughs> so that's a very powerful tool. And what I liked about it was that they have an easy to learn DSL. It's Ruby-ish, I think it's Ruby uh, somehow. I never used Ruby, so I think, but I think it's <laughs> Ruby. And uh, it's easy to learn, it's easy to understand. And uh, once you set it up, you can like uh, grab some configuration you find somewhere and then you integrate it into your configuration and it will mostly just work. That's pretty cool. It has wonderful Grok. So Grok, for those who don't know, Grok is a uh, typed regex, I think it's fair to say. So it's also based or it's, it stems from Ruby, I think. And uh, Grok, you can say, as you can see here, you, you're in the middle, or maybe it's a little bit too small, but you have predefined regexes. So here, for instance, we have timestamp ISO uh, 8601. And this is this will evaluate to uh, to a regex that is then matched to the whatever block line comes along. So you don't have to have a long long regex expression that passes everything. You can just compose regex or uh, compose expressions from other expressions, and you can put them in a variable and then use them. And it's very nice because it very it's very descriptive uh, what the regex is about. So for instance, this one will just um, yeah match for a timestamp match for an IP address, and then uh, match for some other stuff that I cut off, but it's an, a normal Nginx uh, log line. So this is what I liked, and the integration also. You have a lot of uh, inputs and outputs that integrate with all kinds of uh, different um, frameworks and different uh, processes and programs, so that's pretty cool. What I dislike is the startup speed. Um, it's a JVM-based uh, program, so it's written in Ruby, but it uses JRuby because of garbage collection issues, whatever. So it uses JVM, um, which is cool because JVM, I mean, we hate, or everyone hates Java, so we are on a Gopher meetup. But uh, I mean, we have to admit that JVM is there for a long time and it has some optimizations that uh, everyone likes. So that's cool from the optimization standpoint, but it's ugly from the startup speed. And since I run everything in a container, so having a, a kind of an encapsulated thing and then have an encapsulated thing within this encapsulated thing doesn't make much sense, I think. So you have a container, you don't want to run a virtual machine within the container. So I try to avoid JVMs wherever I can. And uh, also, it's also it's log centric, so it, it, it's called log stash. So uh, log, yeah, log stash. So it's log centric. It passes logs and it can derive metrics from it, but you rather don't use it for um, yeah for metrics or for tracing or for for other things. So this is what I hated a little bit. And then I moved on to Heka. Who knows Heka? It's a Go, oh, a couple of you. So it's a, it's a, it's a Go um, program that is kind of a little bit like Logstash. So you have inputs and outputs, or you have different pieces and you can connect these pieces and then uh, messages will flow through these uh, plugins and you can massage them. But setting it up and changing the plugins was a little bit cumbersome, so I think I didn't use it too much. So I, I moved along, I moved from Hacker, I think, back to Logstash. And then the obvious ones, like uh, syslogs, like rsyslog or syslog ng, I used to uh, temper with logs. And also I looked a little bit into Riemann, but Lee Riemann is uh, closure. So, I mean, too much parentheses, I think, for me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and FluentD is also a long standing thing. But Fluent, for me, was not uh, powerful enough. Then I moved back to Logstash again. So there were a couple of things that I tried out, but none of them were really applying to this Melita stack that I have, right? Or this Melita approach or motivation that I had. So I thought, what should I do? 
Um, and as I never used Go so much, I thought, okay, I need a project that I can create in Go. And, uh, and this would kick out the, the speed issue, the startup speed issue, right? So I kind of recreated, or first I, first I, for first I used Fullerite, which is from Yelp, uh, which is a little bit like, like uh, Logstash, but it's also log-centric, and it's not easy to, to temper with it. And I, I tried it to fork it, or I forked it, and I, I created my own plugins, but it was never a really good fit. I refactored a little bit to uh, a tool that I called QCollect, but also since Fullerite was not really um, something that I, that I had, that was sufficient for my use case so much, I eventually wrote everything, rewrote everything uh, from scratch um, with uh, with the ideas in mind that I learned from uh, Logstash and all the other things, and this is what I call now QFrame. And the architecture overview, I mean, this is an example. Um, I have the same basic things that are in Logstash, so I have inputs, filters, and outputs. I just call them differently. I call inputs collectors and outputs handlers, and filters I kept. Um, but I also introduced caches. So for instance, uh, uh, I have a collector that um, log connects to the Docker engine and derives the Docker events out of it. So when a container starts, when a service is updated, when a network is created, these events are um, collected and pushed through the system, and the inventory will take these events and will generate an in-memory uh, inventory out of all the stuff that's running on your Docker engine, or on your Swarm cluster, for that matter. And then um, other parts of the system can just query the inventory for, like, say, uh, when you have a, a container event that, uh, that knows, OK, I'm part of the task ID whatever, then this filter can uh, query the inventory for this task ID and have all the information about the task ID, the, the whole task. Or if you if you know that you are part of a service, then you can just, uh, and you only have the, um, the, the service ID, then you can query the inventory for all the service information. And the same goes for nodes. So if you know you are on node ID, uh, node ID X, Y, Z, which is the only thing you know if you have only the container information, then you can query the inventory for the node. And then you have the node name, the node IP, the node version, and so on. So I created these caches to hold information for others to query. And once this, uh, this, this processing is done within filters and within collectors and uh, the caches, then you can push it to uh, a handler, and the handler will just forward it to whatever the handler is about. So I have a handler for Kafka, and I have a handler for Standard Out, I have a handler for Elasticsearch, and so on. And I have a little list uh, at the end. So you can just forward it to whatever service you want to forward it to. And uh, this is not a one-to-one -one mapping, obviously, so you can have different filters in your processing line, you can uh, loop back to uh, other filters if you have to uh, run it through it again. So it's a, it's a, uh, a, a framework of, of uh, plugins that passes messaging all along. And I think if I had wrote it in some other language like uh, Python, that's the only language I know really, I think, Bash would be fun, but um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think Python would be my, my, my choice before I go. I mean, that would be like, crazy. Like with Go channels and Go routines, it's very easy to spin off uh, processes and have uh, Go handling all the, all the cool uh, nitty-gritty details because like, as we all know, parallelism is uh, baked into Go. So Go was a very cool choice and I was pretty amazed that I could like, do my naive stuff, like passing messages around without a big performance impact. So my, my handler or my collectors run with like 5 to 10 megabytes of memory and uh, like two or one or two percent of CPU and like crazy. I have never <laughs> envisioned that it would be so so fast. I, I was like, yeah, I was really amazed. So no, no clicking for me. Okay. Or maybe it's reloading. Internet, hello. Mm -hmm. Let's try again. Come on. So go go is great. <laughs> do, 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 but you said that the internet might work now, so maybe I, I, I tether to my phone, so maybe I should go back to the. It's like live presentations, right? <coughs> yeah, IP address for me. Cool. What? Bam, bam, yeah. So, 
firewall, it's okay for the next two hours. I don't care. Hack me. Um, yeah, um, and I like to take around with a holistic uh, idea that I, I, I said uh, earlier. And with this little framework, it's very cool, very easy to create little plugins. Or very cool, I mean, I, I'm the only one writing it. Maybe some others would say it's cool, but it's very, to me, it's very easy to write little plugins. And uh, so I can tinker around with this idea very easily. I can create plugins like in five minutes or so and, um, and uh, push, push them out. It's very cool. And what I didn't like about this full ride aspect, for instance, was uh, event versus processing time. And someone heard about this, this problem in the, in the monetary world. So the thing is that if you have something that receives something, like ex let's say a log stash receives an event that is from one hour ago, it will take the incoming event with the processing time. So I saw this now. Mm -hmm. But the event time is one hour ago. So if you, and, and if you process this further in your pipeline, then you should really like get it back to the process uh, to the event time, right? Because if you if you write if you read a file because your system or your, your service crashed, for instance, and you read a file that has uh, historic data in it, what you don't want is that all the data that is in your file is presented as yeah, it just happened. So you want to uh, tag it with the event time and not with the processing time. And Fullerite didn't follow this model, so it was just saying you know I saw this now and I think that happened now, so that's not really the thing that you want to do. And also collection and or aggregation is uh, something that I would like to be in this little framework. So um, I don't want to, s I, I want to sample everything very, very often. So maybe let's say one second or so, but I don't want to push everything in this time interval to backends or to other aggregators or to other systems. Um, and so my system should be able to aggregate and uh, make a five minute or so aggregate and send this off to different systems so that that you can have a very detailed view on a certain node, let's say, and maybe you can even query this node for more detailed data because I have a buffer, which I don't have yet, but I, or I had it once, but I threw it out again. But uh, it, it should be able to, to, um, to have high detailed data on the node and only send aggregates uh, abroad, so to speak. But when the system uh, on top says, yeah, there's some issue, so let's look into the information that is more detailed on the node, so the in, uh, the the host on the on a higher uh, hierarchy could reach out to the system and say, "Yeah, give me the last hour," and very detailed. So I think that's also very cool to have. And what I also want to do, I want to derive metrics from logs. So obviously, I want to um, say uh, there is an nginx log, and I want to get out the response time, the response code, and create metrics for this, and also derive inventory from collection. So. If I have a system that sends metrics, then I might say, yeah, this system seems to be alive because it sends metrics, it sends logs. So for the collection agent, it's very easy to determine what's currently going on on a system. And if a system doesn't send logs anymore, then it might be dead, rightfully so or not. But it's, it's easy, I think, on the collection side to just um, get this information and create an inventory out of it. And there are a lot of other things that I, I don't mention and I forgot maybe, but there's a lot of things that I I think around this. Okay, the plugin system is hopefully not the ugliest uh, Go code, but this is a plugin basically. So there's a lot of, uh, or the, the upper part outside of the rectangle is just setting up stuff. Um, and the most interesting part is just uh, within this rectangle. So I, cr I use this tail file tail, where is it? That tail file uh, plugin, which is just tailing a file, I mean, obvious. And what I have to do is just send uh, the, the last line, like 49, uh, send data to a broadcast channel, and then that's it. So you can create a plugin very easily, uh, take the template, and then uh, use this line to send it to the system, and that's what you, what you have to do. And by using various kinds of, uh, of messages, so I have messages, I have metrics, I have inventory information, I can, or container events, so I can decide what kind of mes message it is by using the appropriate type, and then all the other systems, or the other plugins in the system can then decide whether it's interesting for them or it's not, so they can just drop it or they can use it or not. So I think it's a very uh, interesting uh, yeah, type system, it's very cool in this. And uh, using it is also very simple. Uh, this is the whole main goal for this little tail um, plugin. So you just set up the channel and you you instantiate broadcasts, uh, broadcasters so that the uh, everyone that is, that is uh, subscribing to the channel can receive stuff. 
And then uh, you create this little uh, collector file on line 24, and then that's it. And I'm just subscribing to the data channel and print out the lines that are tailed. And this is how it looks like. It's just, I have a little file that I write with two lines, and then I run my program. It starts a collector, and then I receive these two lines. So it's pretty, pretty easy. And having a bigger system would just include more of this new config and uh, new, new uh, plugin uh, things, and um, I can forward uh, messages to it. So this, but this is all static. Um, most other systems that are written in Go that I, 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 I heard of or I know is they use the init function within the main or within the plugin to somehow um, you know, um, register themselves in a, in a dict, and then you can, with the configuration, decide whether you want to use this plugin or not. So you have one big binary that includes everything that's there, and, um, and then you can use it. What I would like to do is um, use Go plugins to just dynamically load the plugins that I need, and then the rest I, I don't need. But it didn't work, so I, I'm not sure. Um, when I understood it, maybe it will work, but uh, when I understand it, it might work, but for now it doesn't. And I'm not sure if it's the best, maybe you can give me feedback on this, maybe I'm not sure if it's the best uh, approach because if you have a little plugin like this uh, file tail plugin, uh, since everything is in this shared object, the short object will be 15 or 20 megs. So if you have 20 plugins with 20 megs, then you have 400 megabytes of shared objects. If you compile everything into the static binary, then you have maybe 30 megs. So I'm not sure if this is really the approach that I should like pursue, but I think it's a nice idea. And I mean, this space is cheap, so. I don't know. Well, let's see what the future brings, right? So the plugins I have so far, um, I mean, you can take a picture or you can watch the video and then pause. So I don't want to go into all of the collectors. I mean, I have a couple of, because I'm so passionate about the Docker stuff, I have a lot of Docker collectors of events, logs, and metrics. So this would be the stuff thing. And uh, yeah, so it could be uh, plugged together. And then you can send it off to Elasticsearch, InfluxDB, or what have you. And the more recent one, but I will talk about this more recent one in a bit, so I don't talk about the recent one now. Um, the problems I have, I think I have a memory leak somewhere, somehow. Um, but if I run it for a couple of days, then it eats up memory. So that's what memory leaks is, right? But I think I will figure it out somehow. And I'm not sure, and I would like to have feedback on this as well, if this uh, sending messages to all the plugins and then let the plugin decide whether to drop it or not is a smart thing. If it's just a pointer, it might be smart, but maybe I should just create a, a direct acyclic graph. So like compute the duck before the actually the actual collector is started and then have like only one flow within the whole system, which would also be allow me to uh, detect when there is a loop within the system so that some plugin pushes it into another plugin that is a input of this plugin again so that the uh, that the, um, the the messages like looped in all in the system, which might be the cause of the memory leak. Who knows? So I, I think I would like to go to this um, yeah, direct acyclic graph approach. And I have to work a little bit on the inventory system. I mean, what's really cool, I think, is to have an inventory system, as I said, that is derived from the source. And I have a plugin that outputs it to Neo4j so that you can just start up your swarm, start the collector, start a couple of services, and then you have a graph of all the stuff that's going on, and then you can have a little JavaScript tool or maybe a major JavaScript tool that provides you with insights and a holistic view on the whole system so that you can have a graph of the system and then you can click on something and you get a metrics out of it, you get blocks out of it and so on. I think that would be cool as well. And also end-to-end -end benchmarks and benchmarks in the plugins. I have some benchmarks in the plugins, but uh, should be obviously more could ever be more, right? Yeah, this would be the the broadcast mechanism of uh, of this uh, talked about. So everything is broadcasted to everyone except the collectors, and I think that's not a smart idea. It sounds weird, but maybe for Go it's cool. I don't know. I have to figure it out. Um, some more ideas. So uh, in the short term, I would like to create a tape deck plugin so that I can have a handler that records everything to JSON lines. And at the end, when I when I'm satisfied with my with my uh, little uh, scenario, I can just stop and then use this JSON line um, file to feed in as a collector, so that I can uh, generate issues in my in in some of my uh, my tools and then 
just replay the issues to test, make integrations test out of it. I think that would be pretty neat so that you can um, generate logs, events, metrics, and all this for, uh, for your uh, CI, CD tool or CD testing tool. And long term, but this is something that I wanted to look at for like three years now, I think, uh, is Spigo. Anyone heard of Spigo? I mean, me, yeah. That's a tool from Adrian Cockcroft, and he worked for AWS. Uh, for he worked for um, for Netflix first, and now he's working for AWS. And he created this tool to simulate AWS stacks or cloud stacks, and he creates metrics and events out of those. And um, it should be kind of nice to have this kinds of um, synthetic generated uh, events not logs to feed into this collector to do some testing against it and some uh, benchmarking. I mean, you can create crazy amounts of little uh, cloud stacks and then feed the collector and uh, watch watch it break. That would be cool. Yeah, takeaway, I put some takes away, uh, takeaway out. So I think Melita should be a part of all deployment stacks. I mean, that's obvious. and. So, but not only focusing on messages and logs, but all this, all the things that I, I talk about, like uh, metrics, inventory. I think inventory is a very integrate part of it because if you don't have information about what's going on in your in your system, then yeah, you 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 don't have a clue, right? So I think putting everything, the whole Melita stack, and I would like to talk about Melita, Melita, um, put everything together and have a holistic view on everything. That would be pretty cool. And yeah. Um, yeah, collect everything at scale and collect uh, something from a number of Docker engines. So with this collector, you can run it in a global mode. So you can uh, have a swarm cluster with five nodes and you, you run a service with this collector on a global mode. So it will scale out to all nodes that you might add or um, might come up again. So I think that's cool. Um, yeah, simple plugins. I think that's my, my goal for this. I mean, maybe they could be even simpler, but I think for startups, it's pretty simple to create one. They are easy to write and rewrite and iterate on and integrate. And uh, yeah, it's developed in the open. It's on GitHub. I uh, try to talk about it a lot. Uh, I reuse libraries all over the place. So you reuse the Kafka official library. I use this uh, tail file thing. So I, I know that engineers try to reinvent the wheel all the time. But with the Go ecosystem, it's very easy to, uh, to get um, libraries in. So I try to do this a lot. Yeah, and have fun coding, coding Golang, right? So that's a, that's the purpose of the whole tool, I guess. So yeah, that's it. That's um, my little presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Feedback? Shoutouts? Runs? Are you related to Beth, uh, Brad Fitzpatrick? No. You are very similar to him. <laughs> okay, that's a very technical question. <laughs> Other questions? Someone who wants to join the team, which is me. <laughs> Leave the team. No, <laughs> okay, cool. So if you'd like to, like I said, contribute, ask, or suggest plugins, open. Cool. Thanks, guys.